Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. My name is James, and in this video, I have to address a mistake I made in the past. Is it when you clearly drew the wrong MOSFET symbol? No, it's... Is it when you said LCD display? No, it's when... Oh, is it when you put the decimal point in the wrong place? Yeah, I do that one a lot. Wait, no! Previously, I said that handheld DMM oscilloscopes were not very good. And then the Element 14 community sent me this one from Multicomp Pro so I could eat my words. Physically, the handheld DMM is larger than a traditional DMM. The crisp color LCD is great to look at, but there is no mode select knob. Also, there are B and C connectors on the top. Which brings me to my first misconception about this device. I thought the scope input came from the DMM probes. Having a BNC means you can connect cables or even 10x passive probes. And the channels support the scaling math when using those probes. This model's bandwidth is 70 MHz with a sample rate up to 250 mega samples per second with a memory depth of 8 kilosamples. And if you need a reminder of the difference between bandwidth and sample rate, check the link below for a video on that. The fastest time-based setting is 5 nanoseconds per division. The screen has 12 divisions, so that comes out to be about 60 nanoseconds. If you zoom out, you get up to 24 microseconds of time before the sample rate drops. To interface with a PC, the Scope DMM shows up as a custom HID device or a mass storage controller. So that means you can just connect the USB cable and then copy the saved screenshots and waveform data to the computer. USB-C is also how you charge the battery, or batteries. There are two 18650 cells that operate in parallel, which is kind of funny because you can remove one of the cells and the Scope DMM stays on. Note, I don't know if that is an intended feature. Oh, yeah, it's also a DMM. Just press the mode button to switch, well, modes. Using the DMM probe inputs on the bottom, you get a four point something digit display with 20,000 counts. It measures voltage, current, resistance, diodes, and capacitors. There is also a 40 megahertz model available and both bandwidths have an optional waveform generator. Also, the price range for all of these is pretty reasonable. Since the model I have does not have the waveform generator, I was interested to see what Jan on the Element 14 community noticed. Even though the datasheet says the generator has an arbitrary mode, it's actually a handful of built-in functions, which is kind of a bummer because it would be nice if you could program it with an arbitrary waveform. Anyway, let's go take a closer look at the oscilloscope functions. When in square wave mode, this AWG outputs an 8 nanosecond edge. On the scope DMM, there is no rise time measurement so I had to use cursors to estimate the rise time to be around 10 nanoseconds, which is probably close enough. Since the cursors are only X or Y, that's the best I can do. So let's see how it works with something more fundamental. Just a quick reminder, an oscilloscope usually has a first order low pass response. The bandwidth, like with op amps, is defined where the response drops by three decibels, which is approximately a 30% change in voltage. Now the AWG is set to a 10 megahertz sine wave with one volt peak to peak. On the scope DMM, it measures 976 millivolts or two to 3% from the expected. With the sine wave at 20 megahertz, the amplitude is a little less. If I turn on the built-in 20 megahertz filter, the voltage drops down to around 670 millivolts peak to peak which is roughly the 30% drop we'd expect with a 20 megahertz low pass filter. Okay, going back to full bandwidth input and changing the sine wave to be 70 megahertz, the voltage goes back to one volt peak to peak. Increasing the frequency, it isn't until about 87 megahertz that we see that 30% drop. For the last test, let's check to see how it does with a common guideline for digital or square waves. That guideline is that the scope's bandwidth should be three to five times higher than the square wave's fundamental frequency. Working backward, if we divide 70 MHz by 5, we get 15 MHz, which is a frequency that the Scope DMM reproduces very well. In fact, it does pretty well up to 25 MHz, fitting very well inside of that 3 to 5 times guideline. So what does all of this mean? Well, I'm impressed. I did not expect the front end to really have 70 MHz of bandwidth. The amplitude going up between 20 and 70 MHz means that the response isn't flat, but for something in this price range, it's not that bad. That said, I do want to show one more thing. Same 25 megahertz signal as before, but watch what happens when I turn on channel two. That is a big change in channel one's waveform. It's because the sample rate dropped in half. Interleaving channels or sharing sample rate like that is common for digital scopes. 
So it's just something to keep in mind that you will lose a little bit of resolutions when both channels are on at the same time. In addition to the normal sample mode, the horizontal system also has a peak detect mode. When running at slower sample rates, the ADC still runs at full speed, but the memory controller only stores outliers for a slower effective sample rate. Here, the slow waveform is kind of jumpy. When I turn on peak detect, we can better see the noise, which in this case is a 100 kHz modulation. The acquisition length is configurable, but frankly, I couldn't tell the difference between 4 and 8K. My guess is that the memory length can affect the update rate, but without a trigger out signal, I have no way to determine what the update rate is for this unit. Last, using two channels with XY mode is kind of fun, and totally unexpected on a scope like this one. There's only one trigger type and it is an edge trigger, but you can select either rising or falling edges. It also appears the trigger flip-flop is full bandwidth because even at 100 megahertz, it still triggers reliably. The trigger circuit supports auto, normal, and single sweeps. And changing the level is just like changing the other vertical settings. Make sure you're in the trigger menu and then use the push buttons. Also, it does support triggering on a channel that isn't turned on. For example, selecting channel 2, which is connected to nothing, causes us to lose lock on channel 1, as you would expect. Overall, I'm fine with the trigger system. It does what it's supposed to do. So, let's talk about measurements next. Overall, there are seven basic measurements that cover voltage and time, and you can have them all on at once. One thing I notice is that the update rate does not seem to change whether they're on or off, which is impressive. I am, however, disappointed by the cursors. You only get voltage or time, and moving them is a case where I really dislike having buttons instead of a knob. And no, this meter does not have a touchscreen. Switching between scope and DMM is as simple as pressing the mode button, and it switches very quickly between them. Voltage measurements work like you would expect them to. What I found interesting is that when you switch to current, you get a confirmation dialog. But when you switch back to voltage, there's no warning, which seems more important to me because when you switch from current to voltage without moving the probe, that's how you blow the fuse. Anyway, Auto ranging while measuring resistors was a bit slower than I would like because it always seemed to take one or two seconds longer than I had the patience to wait for. But at least the screen is super easy to read. It can measure diodes and LEDs, however, the forward voltage is limited to about two volts. So like other DMMs, it's enough to light up a white or blue LED, but not enough to measure their forward voltage. And for caps, its datasheet says it supports capacitors from nanofarads to thousands of microfarads. For stuff in the 10 to 100 nanofarad range, it did fine, but it seemed to struggle to measure anything larger than 100 microfarads. Overall, I think it works fine as a DMM, and really, that large color display is very nice to look at. By the way, I just want to point out that my non-engineering mother was able to use it to measure capacitors and resistors just fine. Thanks to my mom for sorting out that big pile of components. So, this tool has changed my mind about this class of handheld oscilloscope DMMs. That said, I still do not recommend units like these to be your first oscilloscope. The push button interface is fine for DMM stuff, but I still found it cumbersome for scope controls. This is not my first oscilloscope, but I still struggle to know what settings to look for or where they're located or even how to change them. However, the analog performance is better than I expected for an oscilloscope in this price range. And it has a few features I would have only expected in a bench oscilloscope. Also to backpedal on something else I've said before, I really like the color screen's readability for DMM measurements. Check the show notes for a link to a couple of blog posts on the Element 14 community for additional perspectives on this device. Remember, that is the best place to ask me electronics questions because I get notified and then I can answer them, sometimes with pictures. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to digitizing waveforms in the palm of my hand on my electronics workbench. That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't.